Good morning to you beautiful people online that are watching today. Um, we've got a fairly, well, I mean, it's not that full, but it looks kind of full because <laughs> we don't have as many seats here th that we would like to. So good morning, though, and welcome, and we're just so happy to be here. Um, do you want to say anything, Pastor Gwenda? <laughs> And back to masks and social distancing, but uh, welcome everyone. We love that um, our little church is uh, filling up this morning and that's really lovely. We do have overflow space, so don't be frightened to come. We'd love you to be here and we'll accommodate you. It's just so good. Just a few little things. I've got a couple of Cheerios this morning because today is Lynn Douglas's 80th birthday. So... So, Lynn, are you watching? Lynn's often watching, so happy birthday to you. Let's have a one, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Lynn. <laughs> and I hope it's an excellent day for you. And just a couple of days ago, we had our uh, dear uh, Rob um, McCracken, 75th birthday. So happy birthday to you too, Rob. You take care, look after yourself. He's been a bit laid up with um, a sore back. So we pray that, Rob, you will feel better very, very soon. And the other cheerio, just quickly, is uh, Mr and Mrs Tibble um, so are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary to the Tibbles. So we've got things happening. Uh, here we are in the new year and life doesn't stop. Life just keeps going. But um, let's just pray as we begin our service this morning. Heavenly Father, it's so good to gather together. And uh, when I say that, I can't help thinking of the psalm that says how, how good it is um, when they ask me to come up to, the mount, up to the mount of the Lord. And Lord, here we are in your church, here we are in your place, gathering together as your people. And Lord, where your people gather together, there's unity and harmony. Lord, and there you command a blessing. So, Lord, we thank you for the blessing here today. We thank you, Lord, that even as I'm praying, I just see, Lord, you're going to pour out blessing today. Lord, you're just going to cover us with your presence, cover us with your blessing. And, Lord, we just um, want to be open and receptive to everything that you have. So we pray a blessing this morning on all that happens here. And Holy Spirit, just invite you to come and uh, speak to us and do with us as you will this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Diana and the team, and I won't be able to say that for much longer. So enjoy this morning's worship. We've got Russell and Bev here from Queensland. Russell's going to bring the word a bit later, so welcome. Welcome to all our visitors, and uh, let's worship together. morning church happy new year um, as I was doing my devotions this morning um, this was actually in devotion this morning it was in Ephesians 5 um, and in Ephesians 5 18 to 19 it tells us to be filled with the spirit addressing one another in palms in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making a melody to the Lord with your heart and this is what we're about this morning yeah amen the reign of darkness now has ended. Amen. <laughs> We're going to sing it. Yeah, would you like to stand? Let's just worship together. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of the king of my
you, Lord Jesus, that you have won the victory. It doesn't matter what comes our way. It doesn't matter what others might say about things that are going on. It doesn't matter. He's already won. Don't be afraid. He's already won. He's already won. And we're just going to come before him and give him all the praise and all the glory and worship his holy name. We worship your holy name, Jesus. Jesus, we worship you and we honour you with all that we have. Yeah, let's just lift up our voices to him right now. Lift up your voices and just give him all the praise and all the glory. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, we worship you. We honour you. We love you. Lord, we love you.
Jesus be the center of your attention. Everything belongs to him. All of our worship is for him. Right where you are, you if you haven't met Jesus, if you actually don't know who he is, he's right here waiting for you to invite him in. You can lift your hand if you if you want someone to come pray for you. And you can just allow Holy Spirit to fill you up. If you need a fresh refilling of his Holy Spirit, just receive it today. Just receive it right now. It's no special formula. It's no special prayer. We're here. We're in his presence. He is here. And he is waiting for you to open up your heart to him. At home, you can do this too. Just receive today. Holy Spirit, we receive. Holy Spirit, we receive. How good it is to just worship the Lord. What a wonderful way to start our year. Life's good. Life's good. So once again, welcome. Oh, there's faces that are here now that weren't here when I said welcome before. So welcome. I'm so pleased that you're here. Oh, who's been away? Been away on holidays? No? Yeah, me neither yet, but I'm about to. So that's really good. I'm going to be on holidays for a couple of weeks, so oh, really good. <laughs> so uh, that'll be terrific, but um, everything's happening around here as normal, and we're going to continue our Sunday services through summer. Next week is a special week. Next week, we um, are farewelling the Harding family, so we're going to make it fun, because, you know, what else are we going to do? So um, Diana and Nathan are going to actually kind of lead the service and take up the offering and do, no, <laughs> no, but, um, but they are going to uh, just present some of their story and we just thought it would be really good because, um, you know, for this year just being kind of disconnected for a bit of the time, you know, you might not have followed all their story through this last couple of years. And uh, so they're just going to share a bit of that. They're going to share what the Lord's been doing in their lives. And I'm sure they've got a special word for Moe New York Christian Centre. And so we'll look forward to that. And uh, bring lunch, bring a picnic lunch. If it's not a day like today, we are going to picnic out on the back block. We're going to have a picnic lunch. We're going to have the coffee van. And uh, we're just going to have a lovely time of fellowship and, uh, and just take time to say goodbye and farewell. So we encourage everyone to come next week because if we have too many people for in here, we're just going to go outside because the numbers aren't limited outside and outside we don't have to wear a mask. 
so that's a good thing. So we'll just take the service out onto the back block if we've got more people than what we have here today. So we're not going to be inhibited by numbers. So that'll be really good for next week. So, all right, we're going to receive our offering right now, um, which we haven't done for a while. So this is kind of fun, taking up the offering again. So um, I was just thinking about one of the things I like to do at the start of every year is ask the Lord for a word for the year. And my word for this year was resilience. I was sharing it a bit with some of the young adults last night. And I've been asking the Lord what that all means, you know. And uh, I guess resilience in a broad sense, it just means the ability to be able to bounce back after something's gone wrong. And you know what? Last year was a year where it wasn't just, you know, needed resilience once. You felt a bit like a ping pong ball a bit, you know, and you just get yourself up and whack something else that happened and something else that happened. But I really believe this year the Lord's rebuilding and going to show us what resilience really is as we get up, as we find our feet and move forward again. And I believe financially too, those who have suffered over the last 12 months financially, this is going to be a year of resilience. This is going to be a year of financial resilience where we're going to bounce back financially. And the Lord is really going to provide in areas that we have lacked in because he doesn't want us to lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. I shall not live in lack. And another one of my favorite verses is, Though the fig tree does not blossom and there be no fruit on the vine and what is it and the branches of the olive fail or something and there be no fruit on the vine or you know and there's no pigs in the fold and sheep in the fold and all those things happen yet will I rejoice in the Lord and I think that's a verse for us for this year too you know things can go wrong things can get out of whack Things can get lopsided. But you know what God's answer for that is? To praise him anyway. My kids had a, a, a poem in a book one day that someone gave them. And it said, you know, would you praise the Lord anywhere? Would you praise him on a cactus? Would you praise him just for practice? You know, and sometimes you feel like life is just a cactus waiting to prick me, waiting to get me. But you know what? I'm going to praise him anyway. So I love that we're able to give of our finances, give of our finances and praise the Lord through those situations and praise the Lord in spite of those situations and give of our substance and give of our offering to him. So do we have a really grateful heart this morning who would like to give thanks for the offering and also perhaps pray a blessing on the church and on all of us wonderful people here this morning. Um, financial blessing. Who would like to do that? Steve. Amen. Amen. Now, you also, this is a new thing too. I just want to commend our sound and tech guys. Let's give them a yay. In one week, they have shifted the sound desk from the back down to here. Now, we're calling it, what, the fortress or the castle. This is our castle. But you know what? Um, we just had a bit of difficulty with the video being here and the audio being at the back so what they've done is they've brought the video and the audio together so and uh so i just really want to thank russell for all your hard work this week russell's built this with nathan's help and um over the weekend uh, i think it was yesterday i said oh have we got words yet because we've had so much trouble with our internet and it wasn't hooked up so sometime in the last 24 hours they found a way to hook up the um 
the projector and get us words and everything this morning. So praise God for that. <laughs> Clever little bunnies you are. But anyway, um, welcome to your new heightened position in the church. And uh, may God bless your ministry. You know, um, let's just give these guys one more appreciation. <laughs> you know, the church wouldn't run with all of these things happening in the background. And uh, we really appreciate all of that. The, the cleaners, we've had, you know, Michelle and Kelly and a whole bunch of people in cleaning over the week and organising things. I mean, this place was... was a wreck a couple of days ago so thank you all so much for what you've done um, and it is appreciated and does not go unnoticed so thank you to all our volunteers right now we have we're going to have communion at the end of the service this morning because we're going to make space for a very special person who I can see now is starting to go, oh, it's my turn. yeah Russell um, Chapman is uh, just a good friend of mine uh, and Beth who's up the back with her beautiful children Ella Rose and Leo. Um, when Russell, when I first met Russell, he was a, an obnoxious skinny little high school kid with a bit of attitude and a bit of a prankster. Nothing's changed, he said. He's grown up a bit and, uh, and he's doing an amazing job of being a husband and a father and looking after his family. But Russell rang our youth group for a little while and, uh, and it's so good to see. I think Jakey was part of that youth group as a young fella and, and we've just got so many still young people and contacts in this town as a result of Russell's ministry while he was our youth leader here. And um, it was a bit sad after Russell left, though. A lot of our youth fell off the way. And, um, but I think there was two things about that. You know, one thing is we've learnt something about that. We've learnt about, you know, really focusing on discipling our young people through and integrating them into church life. But we also learnt, you know, the kids loved you. And, uh, and you know, we honour you for the years that you spent here as a youth leader. And... Uh, the other thing was that Russell spent one or two years living in my home, which was an experience. And uh, while they were doing Bible school, there was Russell and another young lady, Eileen, and they kept me on my toes. And I also had two or three other young children, I think, in the house at the time. And so it was very interesting during those years. I think one at one time, our remote control went on holidays. And we got ransom notes and pictures from all over Australia about where the remote control was when uh, Eileen was looking for the remote control for weeks. All right. Without any further ado, I just want to hand the platform over to Russell, who's going to come and share a word with us this morning. So let's welcome Russell. Okay. Good morning, Moe. <laughs> I think one thing that uh, Gwen has forgot to mention was my um, my favourite minister in the church was Nathan with the video announcements. <laughs> they, they they lasted only a few weeks, but uh, <laughs> there was a good reason for that. Um, anyway, welcome to 2021. Who is excited to see the end of 2020? Uh, <laughs> I know I am, but I'm not sure that 2021 is looking any better at the moment. But, you know, we've got hope. We've got hope. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been in this building, like Glenda said. And um, a lot has changed. My wife's in the back room there, and I've got not only one kid, but I've got two kids now. And um, they're the two cutest kids in the whole entire world. And if you don't believe me, you can have a look later. Uh, know that I'm telling the truth. But um, I never thought that... Uh, you know, I'd be such a, I mean, I'm a good dad. I never thought I'd be such a great dad. <laughs> and, um, you know, being a dad is really cool, but it's also weird sometimes. You know, I never thought when I was a young person that I'd be a dad running after a screaming toddler through the house just so that I could pick her up and smell her bottom to see if she's poop or not. But, uh, but it's normal. Everybody does it. Well, I know it. Um, but we've been living on the sunny coast now for 
for about five years and we absolutely love where we live in Caloundra. And um, we, when I first moved into up to the sunny coast, I always imagined myself expanding my vocabulary to include words like grouse and, you know, and um, gnarly because I wanted to learn how to surf. But within the first week of moving up, there was uh, radio reports of sharks being caught in the shallow waters of Caloundra. There were two people in one week that stood on stonefish and had to be rushed to hospital. There was a warning of jellyfish uh, being washed up on the beach. And, um, and actually, somebody at the Caloundra Beach got bitten by a brown snake. And so I thought, if the lifesaver can't get to me within three seconds, there's no point in me being out that far. So I have not <laughs> learned how to surf. I'm the same old Russell I was before, <laughs> before I left. <laughs> but um, we actually built a house, our very first home, about 18 months ago. And um, the sunny coast is really famous for its endless summer. Uh, we've got sunshine most days all year round. But the one thing that uh, the sunny coast is also known for is the wild storms. And um, about six weeks after moving in, sorry, this is Ella Rose. She can stay up here, it's okay. Um, <laughs> about, yeah, six weeks after moving in, we had a wild storm lash the sunny coast. And um, we had golf ball sized hail come flying down at what seemed about 80 kilometres an hour. It was just smashing up cars in the street, smashing up houses. And uh, we've had to replace our roof, our garage door. My work van got smashed, I had to get re that replaced. But after six weeks of moving in, this wild storm um, caused so much damage that we had to put an insurance claim. And it was a brand new house. And um, this morning I kind of want to follow that topic and I want to talk about getting through the storm. Because if 2020 has shown us anything, it's shown us that the storm can come at any time. And, um, you know, this uh, COVID hasn't just brought a global pandemic throughout the world, but it's also brought many storms with it. And, um, you know, the mental health issues have just risen, suicides risen. Um, I actually read a study a few years ago that during Christmas time, uh, that was the highest uh, time for divorce rates because people would take time off work, spend more time at home with their families and realise they weren't enjoying it. And um, I can only imagine that COVID would have caused you know, would have made divorces skyrocket. So there's so many storms that come uh, through with COVID, but I want to talk to you this morning. I want to gather some points um, and try to get us through the storm because, you know, as I can see, we've still got masks on. It hasn't disappeared. There's still going to be some issues. Um, so if, you're, if you've got your Bible with you this morning, you can open up to Matthew chapter 14, and I will just quickly open up in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for uh, this time together, God, and I just pray that your Holy Spirit will come this morning and just minister into the hearts of every person here. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, the fact that we can gather together in a room again. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that are affected by COVID, uh, but Father, we just really look to the future and we really look to you and trust in, in your victory through this season. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Okay, so from verse 22 um, in Matthew 14, it says this. This is just after Jesus fed the 5,000 people. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were frightening, uh, fighting heavy waves. waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. But if we go back to verse 22, I want to get, get a point from this little bit here. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray, Night fell while he was there alone. And my first point for you this morning to help us get, get through these, these storms is to spend quality time in prayer. You know, we, I know that we, we can pray in our vehicles, 
you know, to and from work. We have our, you know, community prayers that we come to church. We have our nightly prayers uh, before we go to bed, which are all great. But sometimes we really need that, that quality time with God, that quality prayer time. You know, Jesus went and isolated himself and got up on the top of a hill. You don't have to climb mountains uh, just to be with God. I mean, you can if that's what you want to do, but I've tried it. It's not fun. You don't have to do it. But this quality prayer is just about being alone with God. It's just shutting out all distractions, having that, that solitude and just being alone with God. The Bible says that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Spending quality time in prayer builds our relationship with God. And if Jesus found it to be important, then I'm pretty sure that we should too. Prayer connects us directly with heaven. Prayer disconnects you from the world and connects you with God. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but prayer takes you from a place of vulnerability and fear and puts you into a place of strength and authority. Prayer is more than just a conversation that we have with God. There is power in prayer. Who believes that this morning? You know, we use prayer to heal people, to save people, to deliver people. Prayer connects us directly with God and the power of heaven. Prayer aligns us with the power of heaven. Before Jesus was crucified, he said that we will do greater things than him because he goes to the Father. And after him will come another, the Holy Spirit, which he left behind for us. And the Holy Spirit allows us to pray for things that are too great to pray for just words. There is power in prayer. And whatever storm we face, whatever storm you may be facing now, your number one tool and weapon should be prayer. The Bible says that our fight isn't against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. This is how important prayer is. Matthew chapter 6, it says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Psalm 34, 17 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord he, uh, hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. There is power in prayer. See, we may be overwhelmed and overcome by the storm, but the storm will never overcome Jesus. You know, it's easy to talk about all of this stuff, and it's easy to walk, out, fit, uh, walk out of here feeling like you know what you're doing, but it's so easy to forget at the same time. It's so easy for fear to overwhelm us and for us to just forget about what we've just learned. Um, G uh, Ella Rose, she's, she's now four, she's just turned four, and um, she's been toilet trained for a little while now. And um, the thing about little people is that they have little bladders and they, Ella Rose drinks a lot of water, so she has to go to the toilet about 6,000 times a day. And uh, most of the time when we're out, she has nowhere to go except for a public toilet. And if you're anything like me, I really don't like public toilets. But Ella Rose has a down pat. See, she'll walk into the public toilet with her hands up in the air and she'll say, I'm not touching anything, Daddy, I'm not touching anything. And she'll stand in the corner while I frantically clean everything before she sits down. But um, there's a shopping centre near us that we go to regularly and they don't have a parent's room as a toilet, so we have to use a disabled toilet. And the disabled toilet has a really big, heavy door that weighs about a tonne and there's no handles on it. So you've got to press a button on the outside um, and it opens and then you walk in and then after a few seconds it'll close behind you and then you can lock it from the inside, do your business and then open it up and walk out. On this one occasion, I open up the door, we walk in and the door wouldn't close. So I thought I'd just give it a bit of motivation and give it a nudge, and it didn't work. So I thought, well, I'm just going to close it myself. So I closed it myself, and, um, and then I realized that maybe it's not connected to the device, and maybe it won't even open now. And so I tried the button, I pressed the button, and nothing worked. So I pressed it again, and nothing worked. And this door is really heavy, and there's no handle on the inside. And if you know me, I'm very claustrophobic. Uh, so it took about half a second for me to freak out. But I was sitting there thinking, I've got to be strong. Ella Rose is here watching me. I can't let my fear control this situation. And I wish I had started praying. But instead, I started yelling. <laughs> and I started bashing down the door, hoping for somebody to hear me. And Ella Rose stopped me and said, Daddy, are you okay? I said, yes, sweetheart, I'm fine. It's okay. And I proceeded to bash down the door. But then I noticed that my fear is then being projected onto Ella Rose. And then she started to panic. Luckily, somebody walked by. They opened up the door and made sure we were okay. But it's so easy to forget when I know that in that situation, if I was, you know, in a right mind, I would have just prayed and it would have been okay. My fear would have disappeared. We would have gotten on. 
I would have known I wouldn't have been in there forever, but my fear took over. If we continue on from verse 24, it says, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. If you are taking notes, my second point this morning is do not let your storm affect the way that you see God. Don't let your situation dictate how you see God. The disciples just witnessed a miracle. They just saw Jesus feed 5,000 people with very minimal food. And just hours after this, rather than riding high, they were in fear. They were fearing for their lives out on the lake. They were in the middle of a storm. And in their fear, they cried out that it's a ghost. Do not let your storm or your situation or your fear affect the way that you see God. Listen to this. God doesn't change depending on your situation. God is the same today as he was yesterday and that he will be tomorrow. God doesn't change. Our situation changes the way that we see him. But God is the same. Just because you're in a storm, it doesn't mean that God's abandoned you. He's still there. He isn't a good bloke to us one day and then mean to us the next. That's not who God is. God never changes, but the way that we see him does. And the disciples saw Jesus through their fear and saw a ghost rather than their saviour. We can look at God through our storm and see him completely different. We can see him as a God who doesn't care, a God that is distant, a God that doesn't love. But if we look at God the way that we should, you know, God created us out of love because that is who God is. God can't create us out of anything else but out of love. And if we look at God through that love, through our faith, we will see him as he really is. Did you know that there is a large portion of Christians today that still struggle with their identity and believing that God actually loves them? And you will know these people because they will go on and say, how can God love a person like me? Jesus only died for me because he had to die for everybody and I just got caught up in the masses. You know, God created everybody out of love. Everybody that's ever lived, everybody that will live, everybody that is alive today, God has created out of love. And if he created you, he found you worthy enough to die for. You know, if we just quickly, if we look into the Bible for scripture and stories and, and, and find characters in the Bible that may, you know, for an example, if we look at Goliath, you know, he's a bit of a shady character. And you would think, how could, how could Goliath be created out of love? You know, we know the story that David, the young shepherd boy, he trained himself uh, to hunt down bears and lions. You know, I've run away from magpies in September, but this young boy <laughs> was chasing after bears and lions to bring back his sheep. And yet his, his own father didn't find him worthy enough to stand in front of a prophet who was choosing the next king. And David got sent to the battle to bring fee, food to his older brothers, and he found this monster of a man, Goliath. And he was so upset, he was so angry. Why does this man defy God? Why are you, are you allowing this man to torment the Israeli army? And we know the story. He went and saw King Saul, and Saul gave him permission to fight this monster. And he, all he had to do was pick up a rock and sling it at his forehead. He knocked out Goliath, he ran over, got his sword, and killed him. And you would think of that story, well, what is Goliath's purpose in this? You know, Goliath was just a monster of a man that defied God, that enjoyed killing God's people, how could God create Goliath out of love? And I wasn't there when, Goliath, uh, when God created Goliath, but I'm sure it would be something like this. As, as God's creating him, he'd say, you know, you will be named Goliath. You will be a monster of a man feared by many. You will not love me like I love you, and it hurts. But there is still purpose in your life to bring glory to me. You will be overcome by a young boy called David, which will open up the doors for my only son Jesus to come and save humanity even in that there is still purpose and there are so many people out here today that still can't find purpose in their life that still struggle to to follow or believe that God loves them and if that's you this morning I'm just here to tell you that God does love you you weren't created for any other purpose God created you out of love to be loved Even New Testament Saul had an encounter with God and turned his life around. 
Goliath didn't, and you would see him as a monster, but even Goliath was created out of love. 1 John 4 sums this up for me. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed that the, uh, the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. My, uh, my point here, sorry, is that we can't allow our storms and our situ- circumstances to dictate how we see God. God is love and created us in, him is, in his image and likeness. We need to look to God through love rather than a fear or hatred or confusion or heartache. And I can guarantee you that you know somebody who's walked away from the church because of a situation in their life that's changed the way that they see God. They've allowed trauma, circumstances to affect how they see God. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God doesn't change. It's only the way that you see Him. Now if we... uh, Yep. Don't let your storm become your vision of God. If we go back to Matthew 14, uh, from verse 27, it says, But Jesus spoke to them at once, Do not be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. And then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Now, if we look at this same story in Mark, it reads it a little bit differently. In Mark uh, chapter 6, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him uh, to Bethsaida while, while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood the loaves, their hearts were hardened. So this is the same story, but it's missing what we find a crucial part. See, in Matthew, Matthew recollects the story as Peter stepping out of the boat, but Mark doesn't. And neither does John. But the interesting thing about Mark is that Mark was actually a disciple of Peter. And then so a lot of people believe that the, uh, the account of the gospel was actually just a, an account of Peter's, Peter's um, memory of who Jesus was. And then so when Mark was, was writing this, Peter was going through what he remembers. But it's interesting to know that the man who stepped off the boat forgot to mention to Mark that he stepped off the boat. Now, why is it? Do you think it was because he was ashamed? Because Jesus accused him of having no faith and he was too embarrassed to put it in? Uh, There's a man called Stephen Furtick over in the States of Elevation Church. And he wrote a sermon on this and he was saying that Peter didn't want to include it because he didn't find it to be significant enough because something followed after that that was more significant, which I'll get to in a minute. But however, I think... In that moment, when Peter stepped off the boat, his main purpose was to build his ego. Hear me out for a minute. I know we talk about this scripture and we talk about having the faith to step off the boat. I've been there, I've preached about that. But for a moment, when Jesus calls out saying, take courage for it is I, Peter responds with, if it is you, Jesus. Peter is, al- is already doubting the authenticity of Jesus' voice. There was absolutely no reason for Peter to step off that boat, except for bragging rights. But it didn't work out. 
He became afraid and Jesus accused him of having no faith. So in his shame, when Mark asked about it, he left it out. But in Peter's defense, there was something bigger that he wanted us to focus on. For, you know, if Peter was successful, if he did step out on that boat and he walked on the water, what would have come of it? Nothing. He would have just had bragging rights. The storm was still there. Nothing would have happened from it. Except he would have been able to brag to people that he was able to walk on the water with Jesus. And so his reward would have just been on earth and not in heaven. He wasn't thinking properly. He, wasn't, he didn't have the, 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 um, the love and thoughts of the people around him at his, in his mind. It was himself. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It's putting the kingdom above yourself. In one moment, Peter is fearing for his life, and then in the next moment, he sees an opportunity to walk on the water. And rather than trying to help the people around him, he sees an opportunity to just brag. He was... He wanted to walk on the water for his own gain. But if he was to seek the kingdom of God first, rather than getting Jesus to prove himself, things would have been different. He would have asked Jesus to calm the storm instead. We need to be careful of how we prioritize things. Do your, priorita- uh, do your priorities benefit you alone or benefit the kingdom? You know, sometimes when we prioritize things to benefit the kingdom, we may, we may not be rewarded here on earth, and that's fine. But Peter was looking for an earthly reward. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. In James it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing uh, from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. And I don't think that Peter was counting more, uh, the others more significant than himself in that moment. Uh, look, I don't want to you know, bash on Peter, but it's a story. I've got to get through it. <laughs> it's about being kingdom focused with a kingdom heart. Uh, just to quickly summarize this morning, my first point was spending quality time in prayer. Number two, don't allow the storm to dictate the way that you see God. Number three, build the kingdom, not your ego. Now, here's another point. Here's a... Here's the real kicker that Peter was getting to, I believe. From verse 32, it says, When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. The storm stopped immediately when Jesus stepped on the boat. It's not about when Peter steps off the boat, but it's when Jesus steps on the boat that the storm stops. The boat was only a vessel that was overcome by a storm. Hello, who needs to hear that this morning? The boat was only a vessel. And when Jesus got on, the storm stopped. Someone here this morning needs to let Jesus on their boat. This is my next point. Let Jesus on the boat. The storm stops. The Bible says that we need to take up our cross daily. Daily. We need to take up our cross. And in case you weren't picking up what I was throwing down or or catching what I was throwing at you, the vessel, the boat is you. You're the boat that's in the storm. Jesus wants to step on the boat to calm the storm. Don't be like Peter. Don't doubt the word of Jesus and then ask Jesus to allow you to walk on the water, to go through the storm on your own so you've got something to prove. Allow Jesus onto your boat. Don't look for Jesus through your fear, search for him through your faith. The storm didn't stop when Peter stepped off. The storm stopped when uh, Jesus stepped on. We can allow Jesus into our lives, but when the days get harder, when the storms start rolling in, we can revert to our old self, our old way of thinking and doing things. And suddenly we become so overwhelmed and overcome by the storm that we forget who we are, we forget who Jesus is. Take up your cross daily. Let Jesus in. Get him on the boat. You weren't designed by God to go through storms on your own. You were designed by God to do it with Jesus. You know, years ago, I, um, when I was living here in Maui and I was a youth pastor here, we finally got a nice, warm, hot, sunny day in summer. 
and um, I thought, I'm going to take the young guys out to the beach, you know, 40 minutes down the road to Inverloch, we'll have a bit of fun. Um, I won't mention the fact that my, my wife, who wasn't actually my wife at that point, was extremely sick, and um, I kind of just abandoned her. That's a whole other story. But I took the boys out to the beach because I thought, we don't get many sunny summer days on the weekend, so let's take advantage of this. So we went out to the beach, and um, we took our boogie boards, and uh, I don't know if many of you ever go to Inverloch, but it's a nice wavy beach. And um, when we got out there, I was paddling out, riding the waves in, paddling out, riding the waves in. I had less fear back then than, than I actually do now because I was um, less aware of what was actually in the water. <laughs> um, but I would paddle in, paddle out, paddle in, paddle out. And at one point, I'd actually paddled out so far that I couldn't really see the shoreline anymore. And Jakey was there with me. He was beside me on another boogie board. Um, so you can ask him if you want, Chris. But, <laughs> but uh, we were so far out that we couldn't see the shoreline anymore. And not only could we see the shoreline, but the wave that we were supposed to be riding were actually forming and breaking in front of us. And it was at that point that I realised I am so far out. I mean, I know what I look like. I'm a delicious shark bait out here. <laughs> and, you know, this is where the sharks tend to wander and I don't want to be eaten. But uh, there was only one other person out there in the water and that was a, uh, he was a surfer guy, looked like he'd been doing it a long time. He paddled out to us and asked us if we were okay or if we needed help. And me being the youth leader, being the big man, thought, I've got this. I said, no, it's okay. My pride got, got you know, the better of me. I said, no, we're okay, we can do this. And so he paddled off. And while I was waiting around in the water uh, with Jakey, I was talking to him, and then all of a sudden, this great big wave started coming up. And so I started paddling forward to try to ride this thing, but I realised I couldn't, man. This thing was so big, it was about five to six metres high, I reckon. And um, I just wrapped my whole body around my boogie board, and this uh, wave lifted me right up. And I thought, this is pretty cool. Like, I can see Zane out there on the, on the beach. But then I, I got dumped. I, I got dropped about five metres into the water. And as I tried to resurface, the wave crashed on top of me. And then it picked me back up again and then dumped me again. It happened about four or five times. And by the time I got to the shore, I was so exhausted. I'm surprised I didn't drown. I was so exhausted, I ripped the seaweed off me. I got to the beach and I thought, where's Jakey? And I turned around and in typical Jakey fashion, he couldn't do things on his own, he had to copy me. I was watching him getting picked up by the waves and being dumped and picked up and dumped and picked up and dumped. And we finally got to the beach and I thought, you know, that may have been different if I had have just been humble, let go of my ego and said, you know what, we do need help. And then, you know, that surfer, he may not have been able to help us a lot, but he would have been able to make the situation a little bit different. But you know what, both of us are still here to tell a story. I've got a little bit of a fear of waves now, but I still get in the water. But taking up your cross daily is continually allowing Jesus in your life. It's not being ashamed of needing help. It's not allowing your ego to get the better of you. We can bang on about the point that it takes faith to step off the boat, but I want to bang on the point about the, the fact that the storm stops when Jesus steps on. And if we're going through a storm today, if we're going to face a storm tomorrow, you never know when the storms are going to come. We've got to allow Jesus onto the boat. See, the, Jesus can see you in your storm. He saw the disciples struggling and he walked out towards them. He can see you in your storm, but it's what you decide to do after that. Are you going to be Peter and try to walk on, walk on the water and walk through the storm on your own, knowing that Jesus is there to help, or are you going to allow Jesus onto your boat? My last point this morning, um, I kind of added this last night when I was rehearsing. But if you go back, it says, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. My last point this morning is that we can't get through the storms, we can't get through another year like last year, if we don't have the confidence and belief to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. It's not about who Jesus is to you, because most of us see Jesus in a different light. It's who Jesus says he is in the Bible. We need to have the belief. We need to know and be confident, have the faith to know that Jesus is who he says he is. He is our saviour, our Lord, our comforter. He's not just a fairy tale in the book. Just as I finish up this morning, I, um, I can't leave this morning. I can't travel 2,000 kilometres down and miss the opportunity to pray for you. 
And I'd love to pray for those people that are in the storm at the moment. You know, they feel like they've been seeing Jesus through their circumstances rather than through their faith. And so I'm just going to ask you all to close your eyes and bow your heads. I'll have a bit of privacy, it's okay. If you're here this morning and you've had a shocker year, like most of us, if you feel like that your storm has actually began to control who you're becoming, if it's controlling who you're seeing Jesus as, if that's you this morning and and you want me to pray for you, if you want to see Jesus the way that you're supposed to see Jesus, if you're sick of walking the, the, the way that you are now, knowing that Jesus is who he says he is, if that's you this morning, just quickly wave to me and I'll pray for you in a moment. I can't lay hands on you, but I can, I can pray. I'm good at that. And if you're the person, if you're a person this morning, if you've been listening for weeks or if you want to know Jesus more if you haven't ever allowed Jesus into your life if you haven't let him on your boat if this morning you want to do that for the very first time if that's you you can give me a wave nobody else is looking it's okay if you find yourself in a storm right now and you're struggling if you feel overwhelmed or overcome by the storm and you just want to help get Jesus on that boat to help you control the situation, then just give me a quick wave and I'll quickly pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. God, I thank you for what we can find if we dig in Scripture. I thank you for the stories. I thank you for the people that have gone before us so that we can learn from. God, I thank you for, for Peter. And, you know, even though he wanted to just step off that boat and and walk towards Jesus and, and, you know, do something crazy, you know, I thank you for the audacity. I thank you for his uh, his faith. I thank you that even even though he was ashamed of that situation, that he wanted us to focus on something more important. God, I just pray that Jesus would just start stepping on our boats. I pray that when we find ourselves in a situation, when we find ourselves in the middle of a storm, that rather than trying to do it on our own, we're going to allow Jesus on, on our boats. God, I pray for 2021. I pray that we will see it in a new light, that we will start focusing more on who you are and who you say you are, that we will start focusing on praying more, spending more quality time with our Heavenly Father. And Lord, for those people this morning that gave me a quick wave, God, I just really pray that you will just be with them. God, I just pray that as they um, get rid of any distractions that they they may be facing, get rid of all those distractions to focus on you, God, I just pray that you will just start stepping on their boats that you will start calming the storm. God, I thank you so much for your love over our lives. I thank you that even though we struggle, even though we may scream and lash out, God, I know that your love for us never changes. And so, God, I just pray that each and every single one of us this morning will understand that love. I pray for your Holy Spirit to just keep ministering today, that it won't stop as we walk out this door. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Wow, what a fantastic word. I've missed your preaching. That's good. Very good. We're going to come around the table of the Lord just as we finish up our service this morning. And I just want to, I mean, what Russell said today is just so good and uh, really lines up with, I suppose, what God's been saying to me about this word resilience and when I was thinking about that even in the light of communion, I was thinking about Jesus who died for us, who died for our sins. Let's hand out the communion elements while I'm chatting. We'll hand out the elements. Jesus died for you and for me. He did. And sometimes we feel like, we know that he rose again at the end of it too, but sometimes we feel like we're stuck in that time in the middle And we're saying, Jesus, I know you died for me and I appreciate that and I take that on board. But it's like we're stuck there and we we haven't yet experienced that, the resurrection. We're just waiting. 
There's a word for it, and I forgot to look it up, but there's a word for that space between Calvary and between the resurrection. And I just want to say, just like Russell was saying, there's some of you, I think, I feel like you're stuck in that place. But I just want to say, you know, Jesus was the biggest comeback king ever. He, was the, he showed us resilience like we just want to know that he didn't stay in that grave. He was there for a reason. He was there for a purpose, but he didn't stay in that grave. He came out of that grave. He rose up from the dead and he came to life, resurrection life, and that's the power and the promise and the purpose that he wants us to live in. Jesus said when he told his disciples about taking communion, he said, take this in remembrance of me. We need to remember Jesus and who he is, what he did. Yes, that he died, that he shed his blood. And his blood, the Bible says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from every sin. And as we take this communion today, I want you to say that, especially if you felt stuck, if you felt like, you know, those sins and things keep coming back to challenge you. You hold that cup today. You hold that cup today and you say that. In fact, say it now with me. The blood of Jesus Christ God's son cleanses me from every sin. He's taken away every sin. It no longer exists in his eyes. If you've received Jesus into your heart, you've got a new beginning. You're a new creation and a new person and sin has no hold over you. So today as we take communion... We want to get out of that stuck place. We want to experience the resurrection life of Jesus. And that's what I want us to focus on today. He died. He went into the grave. The Bible says he confronted hell on our behalf. And he dealt with it. And he conquered it. And he rose again for you and for me to give us a victory over sin and ultimately over death and hell. Isn't that something to celebrate as we take communion this morning? All right, let's, what we do, if, you, if you're not used to this, we take this little piece of bread and it reminds us of the body of Jesus and the, body, the Bible tells us that Jesus took bread and he said, this is my body which was broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. So today as we eat this bread, let's remember the body of Jesus that was broken for you and for me. Let's eat together. And I just want to repeat that verse again, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from every sin. Is there someone here today who would like to stand on our behalf and give thanks for the body and the blood of Jesus? Just stand up where you are and give thanks on our behalf. Jesus and Lord 
Just like John the Baptist said when he saw you, he said, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that that's what you did. And we take this cup now in your name. Amen. Let's drink together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us so much. Thank you for the great word that was shared today, Lord, that um, Jesus, yeah, we want you in our boat. We don't want to be out at sea on our own. Lord, we can face anything with you there with us. And you have said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You've said, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the world lord and you are with us every day through thick and thin through the storms through the good times and lord we thank you for that so today we thank you for being with us now and we thank you lord that you will be with us even as we leave this place today would you bless us lord and father we just take your peace and your grace and your love with us as we go in your name jesus amen Amen. All right, this is church. It's done. Good morning. God bless you. Stay around for a cuppa and a bit of fellowship and we'll see you next week. Don't forget to bring your lunch next week. We're having a picnic lunch. Okay, we'll see you then. Good night.